four volumes on Cuba's history. Her book, Visions of Power in Cuba, Revolution, Redemption, and Resistance, received the 2014 Bryce Good Book Award from the Latin American Studies Association. That's one of the most prestigious uh, prize books for Latin America across all fields. Guerra has received uh, fellowships from the uh, Guggenheim Fellowship Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. And Silvia Pedraza is professor of sociology and American culture at the University of Michigan and Arbor. Her research interests include the sociology of immigration, race, ethnicity in America, and the sociology of Cuba's revolution and the exodus. Her work seeks to understand the causes and consequences of migration as a historical process that transforms persons and nations, as well as social revolution ruptures with the past and attempts to create a different present. She's the author of several books, the most recent one is Political Dissatisfaction in Cuban's Revolution in Exodus, and she's working on a comparative volume on the Cuban and Venezuelan revolutions. Now, let me, the way in which I think that we can have a better conversation is to start by having a series of questions, and I will organize my questions around three issues. The first one has to do about the causes of the protest, the meanings of the protest, the differences and similarities with the past, the second round of questions or comments will be around the state responses. You know, whether is there still a unity between the army and the communist party? What is the legitimacy of the Cuban revolution nowadays? How is the Cuban elite, how is the elite of the Cuban communist party ruling now? Because until a few years ago, they also have a lot of legitimacy, but now is it only repression? How are they ruling? And finally, what are the different responses of the different academic communities in the Americas? You have the left or the ultra left that believes that everything is the fault of the embargo. Then you have the ultra right that is ready to go and invade Cuba. And then you have voices that are against the embargo and are for democracy and human rights all over the Americas. So it will be very interesting to try to understand where these positions are coming from and you know, to flesh out what are the different visions of of Cuba, I mean, what's the meaning of Cuba and what can we do as scholars? So as I said before, the first round of questions is around the causes of the protest, the similarities and difference with the recent past and their meaning. So let's start with Silvia Pedraza. Thank you, Carlos. And thank you so much for your invitation, which I am uh, very grateful for. Um, the causes, I think that a number of different things have come together at the same time in Cuba and it's created kind of what in slang people would call a perfect storm, okay? One of the items in that perfect storm is that Cuba has been having a very deep economic crisis for quite a while now. And for example, last year, GDP, gross domestic product, contracted in Cuba by 11%. Uh, so that crisis has been there, you know, the last decade has been a decade of economic decline in Cuba. Cuba exports very little, imports a lot, including food and other necessary goods. And then last January, just a few months ago, Cuba engaged in a currency reform, which was very deep uh, in order to get rid of the CUC, the convertible peso, a sort of artificial currency that it had adopted for many, many years, and it returned to the peso. But in the process of doing that, they didn't do it gradually. They did it you know, overnight, uh, and it created a huge inflationary spiral, and goods and services and food and so on were completely uh, out of the reach of, of the average person. Uh, in addition to the currency reform, there is the fact that Cuba has now uh, very uh, new leadership uh, due to old age, Raul Castro stepped down and in effect handed the revolution over to Miguel Diaz-Canel, who has stressed from day one that what he wants to do is continue with that, continuity with the past. And so Havana now has a lot of billboards where you see the old you know, Cuban foundation revolutionaries like Jose Martí, Carlos Manuel de Céspede. And then you also see at the end of it all, you see Fidel Castro, Raúl Castro, and then, you know, uh, Miguel Díaz-Canel. Uh, 
However, Miguel Diaz-Canel doesn't have a lot of charisma. He's not very close to the people. He hasn't established a very good relationship with them, with their hearts and their minds. And so there is now for the first time, I think in Cuba, a serious lack of charismatic leadership at the helm of the revolution. In addition to that, I think that there is the pandemic, okay? And I think that what we have seen with the pandemic is that the pandemic can be very powerful in pushing uh, people to change their governments. I doubt very much that we would have been able to uh, not uh, have Trump for president again for four more years had it not been for the pandemic. And I think that the pandemic is having similar sorts of results in Brazil, also in India, where it has led to people uh, being certain that their government cannot look after them and is not doing the very best job. And so it has had a, you know, a negative uh, uh, quality for the people. Uh, also, Trump uh, engaged in very serious sanctions with respect to Cuba, right, the last two years before he left power. And in particular, for from my point of view, the fact that he did away with things like uh, Western Union, there are no longer Western Union offices in Cuba, so that the Cuban exile that had been rescuing their family back in the island could no longer do so because it was no longer possible to send money. Family remittances uh, you know, have declined steeply. I mean, there's just actually no way to send money and many goods right now. He also cut away a lot of the... Uh, commercial flights to Cuba. So the relationship between the Cuban exile community and their family back in the island, which for many people was very, very tight, all of a sudden is, um, you know, is steeply declined. And then last but not least, I think is the impact of, of the internet. Okay, just last Sunday, um, Jorge Ramos of Univision in Al Punto interviewed the uh, independent journalist in Cuba, Abraham Jimenez, uh, and Abraham Jimenez said that the internet completely changed Cuba, okay? And I think that that really is true because before there were lots of times when somebody on the street would challenge the police, would challenge the state, but nobody knew about it. Nobody had heard of, of what had happened. And so the internet not only brought the rest of the world into Cuba so that people could see what people in other countries lived like. But more importantly, I think it made it possible for people in the island to communicate with one another. And we have seen in other social movements in recent years, for example, Tahir Square in Egypt, that the role of the internet was incredibly important as people were messaging each other and telling each other where to go and what to do and who to do it with and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, all of that I think has created what one can only call a perfect storm in Cuba. And what we have just seen is for the first time in the 62 years of the Cuban revolution, very, 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 very massive protests across the island. And uh, that also is very important because until now the Cuban government was saying that the dissenters in Cuba were grupusculos, little, little, little groups of people, okay? And what these protests have shown is that they're not grupusculos, okay? It's very widely dissatisfaction in Cuba with the regime and the uh, uh, government is very widely spread throughout the society and across all provinces of the island. So I think we're witnessing something very important um, and I hope that in the ways in which we can as academics, teaching, contributing to the media, having these conferences and so on, I hope that we can uh, help people to understand what is happening in Cuba. Thank you, Silvia. Javier, do you want to continue or respond to Silvia, however you want to proceed? Um, no, I have not. I mean, I don't have any disagreements. I actually may want to add a, a, a particular point. Um, I think what Sylvia has told us is essentially the way that Cuba is living a new type of special period uh, with multiple causes versus the special period of the early 1990s probably only had uh, one exogenous cause, the decline of the Soviet Union. So, so I think she covered um, mostly everything. The one thing that I want to say, and I want to say it right now, is that uh, it's very important that we understand that the this is a protest about a public good, about liberty. And I think Cubans understand freedom in very broad terms. It's not so much, you know, we wanna get a vaccine and we wanna be able to get our remittances, as important as those things are, is 
they are absolutely overwhelmed by a state that to this day controls 80% of the economy. It has a monopoly on your life. You have the reason the embargo hurts Cuba so much is because you don't have an alternative to it. You cannot have your own businesses. The United States may impose an embargo in other societies and the private economy can function. But in Cuba, there is no private economy. There's constant discussion of we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and it's so limited. So there is a protest on behalf of freedom, and this is a freedom from a command economy that is so archaic because during the Cold War, even communist states gave up on this idea that the engine of growth of a particular society has to be fully in the hands of the state. And it's very important that we understand, I think, how broad-minded the citizens who are out there protesting, uh, thinking when they think in terms of liberty. Thank you, Javier. Michael? Um, hi everyone. Well, first, thank you to the for the invitation. It's wonderful to be with close colleagues whose work I, I admire so much. Um, you know, I, I again, I have little to disagree with. I, I, I perhaps will just try to add some thoughts, um, maybe some complementary points. And I also want to take the question of the meaning of the protests in a little bit of a different direction, because of course, these protests have meaning first and foremost for Cubans themselves inside Cuba, but they also have geopolitical implications, they have meaning um, in South Florida where I'm sitting. Um, so I think that's all you know, worth, worth uh, bringing into the, the, the conversation. Um, you know, one of the things, I, I don't know if it's so much about the, the meaning of the protests per se, but just one of the things that I've been thinking about in, in terms of their, their internal repercussions and how we read into them is, is the way in which they, they have caught everybody by surprise. Um, now I have read, at least they caught me by surprise, um, which is not to say others and perhaps some uh, some of us in this Zoom room sort of saw tensions building to a head in one way or another. Um, but I think what's so remarkable about this is that is that this was seemingly organic, very horizontally organized. Um, I'll echo a point that uh, our our mutual colleague Rafael Rojas made recently that you see, you tended to, you, it seemed as if there was kind of a hidden civil society that was coming out of these protests, right? Um, local actors and leaders that are not part of either sort of government institutions or the organizations that we typically associate with civil society, whether the opposition or other kinds of civil society, right? So the kind of horizontal uh, organizing strategy of this, if you will, um, if there even was a strategy, right? Because it, it is very spontaneous. Um, I think is remarkable, right? But I think it also propose it also poses a real uh, challenge going forward. Um, if you are um, sort of in the shoes of the protesters or those who sympathize with them, I think it begs a really real question: How do you channel what happened, given sort of the horizontal nature of, of what occurred? And and I don't think we have you know the answers to that, frankly. Um, and this is a very interesting moment because. You know, it was as if, um, uh, you know, what we tend to think of as civil society, including Cuban opposition groups, they themselves were caught by surprise and they kind of went out onto the street to then participate, but they weren't by no means sort of leading it. Um, that, that's, and that's, and that's, that's remarkable. And I'm not sure what to make of that exactly, but I think it's worth, worth noting. Um, let me perhaps compliment something that, that Javier said. Um, it, perhaps it's a, it's a slight difference of opinion. Uh, or maybe more of an open, open, open question. But in terms of the, the multiple valences that the word freedom can have, I think this is a really rich area for reflection and, and discussion and continued observation. Because I certainly agree that people want freedom from a command economy. Um, they want a fulfillment of some of the promises of updating and actualization and, and all that, that that have been floating around for, for 10 plus years. I'll just say as an aside, I think that one of the lessons of these protests or one of the meaning is the missed opportunities of cycles of reform um, that have come before this, right? And, and having not followed through and perhaps creating some of the circumstances that led to this. But, you know, I also see people responding to, you know, insofar as there is an economic component of this, which I think, you know, economics and politics here are deeply imbricated. Um, I think you also see people responding to kind of a stripping away of state capacity when it comes to social welfare. 
Um, you see where people responding to a program of economic reform that at times has seemed rather neoliberal in nature, right? Even if that's not the, the language that's, that's being used. And in the context of this moment, when the COVID crisis is um, at its worst after Cuba controlled the disease pretty well for most of 2020, I think the idea that the healthcare system, that sort of paradigmatic achievement of the, of the Cuban revolutionary social welfare state is sort of on the ropes, right? Um, this is a, a symbolically very um, significant thing that I think speaks to diminished state capacity, diminished uh, subsidies, right? So th there's a tension there, it seems to me, in terms of you know, aspirations between sort of perhaps a, a vision of pure free market um, uh, ideals versus actually wanting a social welfare state that works, right? And I think it'll be up to Cubans in the future to, of course, um, you know, hash that out. Um, so I don't know. That's it's just an interesting tension that I, that I that I see. Um, let me say something quickly about kind of the meaning of the protests beyond Cuba. Um, these obviously have significance for the Cuban American community. I'm in Miami, you know, my, all of Miami, it feels like has, has, has mobilized, right? It's difficult to drive down any street and not see a, a pickup truck with, you know, giant Cuban flags flying. Um, this seems to me like a moment of, um, of baptism in a way in, in La Causa Cubana for, for a new generation um, in a way that, you know, things like the Elian uh, Gonzalez crisis were at a, at a prior moment. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it, it is as if Miami is sort of feeling once again that we are on the verge, right? And I, I just, I can't help but feel a note, uh, you know, I guess voice a note of caution. Um, we've been here before <laughs> in a way. Um, I, I don't know if any of us has the answer as to whether we're really on the verge of a, of a tipping point, perhaps. Um, but but um, some of that energy in Miami, I think, is certainly being channeled in directions that I find quite quite um, unproductive and distressing. Uh, the talk of military intervention, you know, it'd be one thing if it was sort of loose talk um, uh, among some folks, but when you have um, elected officials um, echoing that call, and this is precisely what voices of Cuban civil society are saying is not needed. And A, it's impractical, um, you know, and, and we've already heard that message coming out of the White House. There seems to be, at, at, as much as this is a moment of sort of communion between protesters on the street and their, their, their sympathizers in Miami who are in solidarity with them, there do seem to be disconnects too. And I think those are worth, worth exploring. And lastly, let me just say something about the implications of this and the meaning of these protests for US-Cuban relations. We know that the Biden administration inherited, um, as, as Silvio was saying, uh, a very intensified program of economic sanctions from the Trump administration. Um, certainly not responsible for all of Cuba's economic or political ills by any means, right? But but those sanctions do do have an impact. We also know that before July 11th, we were starting to get signals from the Biden administration that they might be finally starting to move on some things like freeing up remittances, opening up travel, perhaps trying to restaff the U.S. embassy. Um, things that really continue to have pretty wide support even in the Cuban American community and had become sort of more urgent in light of the humanitarian crisis that, that Cuba finds itself in the, in the midst of. Now, however, after these protests, obviously the optics of the Biden administration moving forward on sanctions just got way more complicated than they, than they already were um, because the protests, I think, feed an argument that we can perhaps discuss um, that you know, perhaps the pressure cooker theory does work. Um, uh, you know, I, I refuse to accept that. I think that denies the agency of people on the streets um, because I think if their demands are not just about politics or not just about economics are also about politics, then we shouldn't buy into that, that kind of a policy argument either. Um, but that, that is sort of the moment right now. And you can see the Biden administration trying to sort of thread this needle um, in, in a, and it's, a, it's not an easy task. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think there's more that can be said about the future of U.S.-Cuban relations in light of recent events, but um, I'll happy to come back to that. Thank you, Michael. Lily? You're mute, Lily. I always do that. <laughs> well, I have a couple of things to say that might, um, you know, serve as a catalyst for us to um, move in different directions or similar directions. First, I would say that recent events, let me turn this light off. I realize it's giving me light, but probably distracting you. Recent events have, oh no, Okay, we'll just stick with that. Recent events, I think, 
are not so recent that have sparked this. And I would say that intellectuals and artists, especially about 10 to 12 years ago, and then increasingly over the last five years, have given voice and a face to this other Cuba that um, has been out in the hallways, perhaps not in the classroom, that has been in the parking lots, if not inside the government buildings, that has been in people's private homes, that has been everywhere. Um, and that other Cuba is that civil society that is um, not organized into associations and unions because all those things um, are illegal. You can't have those kinds of organizations without the approval of the state and often the infiltration of the state. But that other Cuba that recent events um, has revealed, um, it was already there and it had a lot of, it had voices and names who would speak on behalf of that other Cuba. I wanna mention Tanya Bruguera, who you know, back, I believe it was in 2011, um, staged a performance piece at the International Art Festival in Havana, where all she had was a couple of people, three people dressed in um, green, you know, olive green uniforms, imitating you know, Fidel Castro's um, speech to the nation on the 8th of January, 1959. She had a podium, she had a dove that was trained to, stick, to, to stand on, that, on the shoulder of anybody who wanted to walk up to the microphones and say what they wanted to say. If everybody rolls <laughs> back to that YouTube video, of how many hundreds of people were there and the kind of courage that it took to say without script, anything. The first person who got up cried. That's all she did was cry. But other people got up there and said a lot. And Tanya Burguera is sitting right now, you know, being interrogated at Via Marista, the headquarters of Cuba's counterintelligence services in this very moment. Hamlet La, um, La Bastida, who was one of the people who was very young and was an artist who urged people on when there was a, a quell or a, a, a kind of break in the momentum of people in that particular event. What am I getting at? He has also been in prison. He was in prison before the protest took place. Um, in, in, two, in 2018, uh, it was common for Cubans to say, arte no tumba gobierno didn't matter what the arts content was, that it wasn't going to topple the state. And a lot of people would respond, and I heard it for the first time, even though that's an old expression that you can date back to the mid-1990s when artists, along with other Cubans, got to self-employ, et cetera. I started hearing, pero artista a veces sí. Artists sometimes do. And what do we have? We have you know, these unprecedented sit-ins against um, the rollback on the right of artists and intellectuals and musicians to sell their work that began in 2018, that continued, that hit a high peak in November of 2020. We have these rap artists who I consider to be intellectuals creating Patria y Vida, giving a slogan and a, and a feeling, you know, an affect to the sense of outrage that not just artists felt, but all Cubans felt. And so I think that that matters because this other Cuba was there and it had, it, it was made up of millions of people, but there, it's not that they needed leadership, they needed examples. And I think that the example of those who could step forward, who had a little bit more privilege, a little bit more protection because they had an international audience, because they were famous writers, because they had some money. That's the story we've heard since the 19th century. You know, the people who were able to step forward and, and to rally support were often those who felt that they had the right to do so because they were products of the system, they had benefited from the system, and then they could challenge the system. Not on its own terms, sometimes on its own terms, but often uh, because they realized that the system was subverting the good, the popular good. So uh, I think that incredibly in Cuba, we also have a pattern every 30 years, we have exactly that scenario. It took 30 years for 30 years of warfare against the Spanish for racial equality, for the end of slavery, for independence. The United States interrupts that. Another 30 years to build up to the 1933 revolution. And then we have the United States stopping the process of democracy. Then we get Fidel Castro, who has the history of all that behind him. And I think that's my second point. That you know, I agree with I agree with Silvia, but it's not just a matter of charisma. Fidel Castro had behind him all of this history that people were aware of, that they had felt, that they, 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 they felt in their bones of having had their, their destiny stolen from them and their democracy undercut by people like Batista, by corruption, by hypocrisy. And the Escanet has like no history. You know? <laughs> Not only does he have like no history behind him that many people are proud of anymore, but he has like no history. People don't even know who he is, you know? And Raul Castro, when he 
between, you know, Fidel's reign and Diaz Canel's reign, we have Raul Castro. Raul Castro spent, you know, a heck of a long time there trying to subvert his own history, erase it, you know, including that of, for which he should be the most disgusted and ashamed, the persecution of homosexuals, the persecution of ideological diversionism. And in this period of his reforms, they were very significant because I think that he and the communist octogenarians like him never realized how that there was another Cuba and that the other Cuba would take full advantage of them. So what were they? They were the right to buy your own car, the right to buy real estate, um, the right to buy a cell phone, private internet connections. I mean, these things by, by the end of 2016 had boomed out of the control of the state. And that leads me to my final point. What did that imply? Well, in many respects, not only did it provide many Cubans with economic alternatives and the autonomy that Javier had talked about, the autonomy from the communist state and from the command economy. It, it implied economic and political autonomy. It implied all these examples of people who could turn their backs on the demands for loyalty, on the demand for public demonstrations of loyalty and get away with it. And then it, it, it also unveiled, and this I think is a, something I haven't heard a lot of people talking about in the media, maybe because we take too long to get here, like myself, but I'll be short. That is the fact that so much of the state's economy is fake. And what do I mean by that? I mean the fact that you go to a government-owned grocery store and every employee in that grocery store is selling outside of the store products that are supposed to be sold in the store. That could be something as simple as you go to buy stuff at the grocery store that's a state-owned grocery store, and there are no plastic bags to put your stuff in. So where are all the plastic bags? Well, there are five people outside the, 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 front, the front of the store selling the plastic bags. You know, pilfering is no longer pilfering. Pilfering from the 90s through the present has become the economy. And the way in which the government continues to, to patch itself together is in part by substituting managers that had once been civilians, and this is a very recent phenomenon, with security agents. You know, so you have like some guy from the Ministry of the Interior who is running a discotheque. It got away, you know, I mean, as opposed to a gerente who used to be perhaps a member of the Communist Party, who was not an intelligence agent. So there's a militarization of managerial positions that speaks to the fact that so much of the layers of the economy are really a facade for the creation existence, not only of the civil society, but of another e economic reality, the economy, which we could call the black market and the gray market all we want, but that's the real place. That's where it's happening. And I think that, it, that the, the recognition of that is not just a, a, a conduit for this kind of expression, a catalyst for the, for the outrage expressed on the streets, but it is also an indictment of how the communist state has become something in the last 30 years, if not earlier, that lives for itself. And they will continue to do so because the political elite and the top brass of the military, they will continue to do whatever they need to do to patch together, to militarize, because they have, they will survive in their minds. They think they will survive. And this, the last few days have shown them that they have been wrong about so many things um, that they, in fact, they may not survive. So that's my, my reaction to the, the panel so far. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, do you want to have a second shorter round about this topic before we move to the next one? I think we could move to the next one. Okay. <laughs> can I, can may I, no, no, actually, uh, sorry, Silvia. I, I just want to say something about um, uh, this idea of the black markets that are so pervasive in Cuba. The remarkable thing about black markets is that in economics, they're very easy to solve. Normally, black markets occur every time you have restrictions on the supply, which is the essence of Cuba's economic model. And yes, it creates a sense of exactly what Lilia, Lilia is saying. It's sort of like you're being, um, you're, there's a big scam all over and everybody's participating in it. But it is, it has a very simple solution in economic theory, at least, uh, which is so sad because in many ways, Cuba's problems, some of them are incredibly complex, but others are problems that humanity has already settled, has already solved. Uh, and Cuba stays, you know, uh, 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 unable to uh, go there in part because I agree with Hillary, um, uh, 
there are many profits you can make by maintaining the status quo um, that the military is keeping in Cuba. That's all. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. So why don't we talk about something that uh, Lily was starting to mention, uh, the unity between the Communist Party and the military. Uh, so I think that's a very interesting question for me because when you have a unity of the elite, it's much more difficult to bring reform or transformation of the system. So uh, Michael, do you want to go first on that one? I can try, although you know, I'll confess that sort of that, that level of analysis is, is not my forte, in part because I think there's so many things about the Cuban state that remain kind of a black box, right? And, and we, are, we are left to read between the lines, read, read the tea leaves the, to the best, the best of our ability. And, and sometimes it's, it's quite hard. Um, you know, it's just interesting in the last few days and, and certainly on the day, July 11th of, of the protests, it was very hard to figure out what was happening uh, at times as, as information kind of trickled out. Um, and in the days following that, um, given the, the shutdown of internet service, at the very least on people's cell phones, it became even harder to sort of figure out. And so that kind of environment breeds, um, breeds rumor, reads bolas, right? Uh, an, old, an old Cuban tradition. Um, and so we, we, we started to hear you know, claims that, um, you know, citizens in one place, I think it was in Camagüey, had sort of conducted a citizen's arrest of the head of the party, turned out to not be true. There was a rumor that was published by ABC, the Spanish newspaper, that I believe the vice minister of interior or something like that had had um, had, had resigned in protest um, over the way the, the, the armed forces um, had been called on to respond to the protest. Uh, I gather that has also not proven true. Um, um, and yet, you know, the, the Cuban state media having to come out and sort of desmentir, you know, these rumors, I think, speaks to precisely what I began with, which is the difficulty of actually figuring out at that level in many ways, you know, how, how the government works. Um, you know, I guess one of the things that's, that's just interesting to, to reflect on in this moment is, is the leadership figure of the Escanel. I think it's hard to... Um, you know, I, certainly in the immediate wake of the, the protests, there has been a kind of circling of the wagons, a, a, a closing of ranks. Raul Castro comes out of retirement, so to speak, to appear in public. Um, it's made known that he has participated in a meeting of government officials to analyze what's happening. So there was a need to sort of bring back the voice of, you know, La Generación Histórica, uh, the historic generation that epitomized that unity so to speak, between you know military and civilian and and, and party, right? Raúl Castro was was all of those things. Diaz Canel is certainly a party stalwart, but he doesn't have a military background. Um, and um, one one wonders, you know, simply what 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 the conversations are are that are happening behind the scenes, um, you know, between distinct branches of the of the Cuban government right now. Um, but I'm not surprised to see uh, again a kind of a circling of the wagons. A, a show of unity, um, an emphasis again is to go back to Sylvia's point on this, what has been this mantra um, of the Diaz Canel administration uh, all along, this idea of continuity that we, we refuse um, to, um, to, to, to do anything that suggests otherwise, right? Um, you know, wh whether that can last and, and outlive this moment, I think is, is a big question. We know on the other hand that there are, you know, uh, there, there are reformers in, in the Cuban government. There are those who are more in favor of market openings as a, as a means to secure political continuity, in fact. And so over the last few years, you have at times sensed those tensions in some of the ebbs and flows of um, some of those market reforms, that kind of opening to small business and then closing back. I mean, one of the things that I would note on that front is that you know, until um, well, until Sunday, it had seemed again that in the wake of the pandemic, the market reformers in the system um, were you know had the upper hand to a degree. Going back to July 2020, sort of at at height of global COVID, Cuba still had the disease under control, but Cuba's feeling the economic price of no tourists for you know, six, eight months, they uh, come out and say they're going to finally move forward on uh, freeing up space for um, self-employed workers. They're going to allow private businesses to actually be legalized. They, that's when they first announced that they're going to move forward with currency reform that they end up doing, um, you know, right at the beginning of 2021. So to the extent that there are reformers either in the party or in the military, um, they, they seem to have 
somewhat of the upper hand. I, I think you know it's it's an open question for me what the events of Sunday mean for that process. On the one hand, the state has already committed to those things. Uh, I also would say that following through on them may be their best bet uh, to quell some of the tensions. But of course, economic reform processes, liberal, liberalizing ones, they have winners and losers, right? And, and the interesting thing about these protests is that they were coming out of neighborhoods in part that had already been losers in a process of economic liberalization. And so how, how does the state, whether it's the party or the army or some combination thereof, um, you know, square that fundamental contradiction? I'm really not, I'm really not sure. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my answer there. Thank you, Silvia. Um, well, I think I would say that, you know, at the distance at which most of us find ourselves, it's really impossible to see any cracks in the military. Uh, however, I do think that if at some point the protests, and I think what we have just seen is at first massive protests, I think that the, there will be others. If the military were to divide and, and the police, and I don't mean just the military, but also the police, and to put themselves on the side of the protesters, I think that that would be a huge success for the protests. And that would really, um, you know, topple down the government as it is now and usher in something else. And I think that what we need to worry a lot about is that the transition to something else, which is going to happen at some point clearly now, uh, needs to be peaceful, needs to be through the electoral system. I think that we need to, if we can, you know, uh, help that uh, to issue in as peaceful and as much in accordance with democratic electoral principles as possible. Lily? Well, you know what? I do think that there are a lot of things that would indicate cracks in the military. Um, let me talk first about the the Communist Party. We have to recognize that the Communist Party was, was a vanguard party, which meant that it was tiny until the early 1990s. And at that point, it went from about 200,000, 250,000 members to over a million. And these people who were brought in to the Communist Party, invited to come, would never have made it prior to that moment. They were brought in more or less in the first five years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were recruited. And they are not ideological. They were there for pragmatic purposes, for pragmatic reasons. It's still very much the case that also today, if you want to advance your career, if you want to be study computer science at the University of Havana, you should really join the communist youth. And beyond that, um, in order to have certain careers, certainly to be a doctor, you have to take an oath in your fifth year of loyalty to the Cuban revolution. And that is an oath that you take before 900 people. If you don't take the oath, and I know of at least one case where this happened, you can be dragged down the steps of the, the school of medicine. You could be taken to jail. You can be left there with a broken ankle for days on end. I mean, there are repercussions for not for simply not taking an oath. So the notion that the political system is, is the means by which one can achieve um, certain professional educational um, careers has to be linked to the fact that the pragmatism of those first folks who joined and the pragmatism of those who are joining now, the communist youth, et cetera, ironically has not been necessarily for those folks to then remain in Cuba. A lot of people have become doctors just so they can get out. And, and the, the communist state depends primarily, I mean, it used to depend first on tourism and then secondly on remittances and then third on the, the tens of thousands of doctors and other professionals, engineers, that it has abroad on government contracts without their families on supposedly missions of solidarity. They are now the only source of income are all those tens of thousands of doctors and all those tens of thousands of engineers, et cetera, who are abroad on these missions. That's their main source of income. Most of the folks who would go on those missions were looking the whole time that they were there for a way to leave, right? Especially those who were single and wouldn't have to worry about their family. So that sort of logic also applies to many people who would go to the University of Havana, study computer science, for the purposes of learning English, getting access to the internet, not because they had an ideological inclination towards the party. So we have tons of people in the party who are effectively not ideologically committed to either the party or to communism. They are committed to themselves, many of them. And a lot of them are not, not even committed to that anymore because the privileges that they once expected they would receive, they have not received. So that's one thing to say. The other thing is that La Fuerza Armada Revolucionarias, 
Um, Habs since 1964 demanded that all young men serve two years of, of servicio militar obligatorio. There are hundreds of thousands of young men who are um, in reserves. I mean, you're in the reserves permanently after you uh, finish your servicio obligatorio militar or it's equivalent because you're maybe um, enrolled at the University of Havana and they let you out of it. Once you finish your militia training, you are in the reserves. And I think one of the reasons that the Cuban state doesn't want to rely on the tanks, although they might be preparing them, is that they don't trust their middle um, people or their bottom people in the, in the Fuerza Armada Revolucionarias. And you have right now enormous numbers of lieutenants, of colonels who will never be generals because the generals, I mean, look at how old they are. <laughs> but the generals are all, you know, in their 70s and 80s. So you never get to advance. And again, when we've had some moments of not necessarily for democracy, when we've had moments like the 33 revolution, what turned the tide once the dictator and his minions had left the island in August of 33 was in fact the rebellion of the mid-ranking officers, the non-commissioned officers. And there is an equivalency among the, the Ministry of, of, Armed, of the Armed Forces with regard to numbers and re, with regard to discontent. Um, lastly, I'll say that the missing piece in the triumvirate of of um, the parts of the state that matter is the Ministerio del Interior. Because the Ministry of the Interior <clears throat> has never forsaken its people when it comes to privileges. And you know, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s to the present, they have their own movie theaters for their, th their children to attend. They have you know, special beach excursions for their kids to attend. We have layers of folks who are agents of the Ministry of the Interior. We have officials and officers of the Ministry of the Interior. Then we have a lot of informants who are in the past were ideologically inclined. And when I say in the past, prior to about 2000, prior to the mid nineties, who might have done this because of their age, would have been happy to inform, had done it for decades, et cetera. But we don't have that anymore. We have people who have to get paid. They have to see some benefit or reward for informing on their neighbors. And they are getting that benefit and reward because Raul Castro has been very pragmatic since he took command of, 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 of everything in 2009. I mean, he was until very recently, the president, the head of the armed forces and the chair of the party. Um, and the Ministry of the Interior, which had somewhat been a rival to his Ministry of the Armed Forces, has risen immensely in its power precisely because it doesn't suffer from the kinds of weaknesses that come from forcing people to do military service and then be in reserves eternally. You know, it doesn't have those kinds of weaknesses. And it has been the case that the Ministry of the Interior has increased its ranks in terms of the ununiformed officers. We're seeing, we've been seeing them, you know, all over. Anybody who went to Havana, you know, in 2011, 2012, um, and, you know, walked around, saw cameras everywhere. You saw a lot of people who would just step forward, men, of course, they're always men, who would step forward if you appear to do something out of step with how you should behave as a tourist or as a foreigner. So this has been something that has been visible and, and it has grown in terms of um, its expansive presence in places like um, stores, in places like the, the economy that is run by the state. So I think that that's the, the third piece here that matters the most. And these people, if we're talking about people who will not compromise, it's Ministry of the Interior. And they're the ones who are interrogating all of the folks who have been detained, including the dozens of artists and intellectuals, et cetera, and the rappers who have been detained, not just all of these protesters. So this is not regular police force, in other words. Thank you, Lily. Javier, do you want to put some comparative <laughs> perspectives of what happened with the fall of communism or the reform of communism, since you are a comparative political scientist? Or if you just want to stick uh, to Cuba, that's also cool. Um, yes, no, um, Carlos, going back to your point, you're absolutely right that when you get these kind of uprisings, and um, Silva made this point, I mean, we all agree that um, the real issue here is whether we're going to see a crack. And, um, and, and let's, let me say a little bit more about the military, because I don't think we have covered it fully, because this is in many ways a very important player together with the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, those points that Lily made were terrific, but let's, let's, let's focus on the military. Number one, they are so invested in the economy. They have such a monopoly that for them, any form of political liberalization represents a huge economic cost. So that turns them inherently conservative here. Uh, um, 
in part because they're so invested in a number of incredibly lucrative economic monopolies. So this is a major problem. How do you convince them? Now, fortunately, people can accept economic losses. So for me, this is not insurmountable, but it's almost like the, the beginning. Now, that's the economic side of it. Let me say a little bit about the, uh, the political side of it. When um, one of the things that I think the armed forces of Cuba are experiencing right now is a huge shock. And let me try to take a few minutes to explain uh, this shock. When Fidel Castro died, I wrote an article where I said, maybe a little bit too uh, dismissively, that the most important, perhaps the only legacy of Fidel Castro was the pacification of the nation of Cuba. Cuba, and we talked about this, Cuba, since, 1960, since 1868, when it started to have its wars of independence, until 1965, when Fidel Castro finally sent 250,000 troops to quash the last insurrection against his regime in the mounts of Escambray, closed a century of constant upheaval in Cuba. It was an incredibly unstable regime where dictators lasted very little, even democratic leaders. Being in Cuba was to be in a place where everybody was uprising all the time. Cuba had the first black uprising that I know of in the Spanish speaking Caribbean in 1912. Um, Fidel ended this. The armed forces loved that. The armed forces are absolutely in love with the fact that they don't have to worry about pacifying Cuba. Here's the shock. Now they're worried. I think what these protests have done is to tell the security forces of Cuba that the system that they have used to maintain this peace, which was incredibly coercive, needs to be rethought. They may decide that we need to loosen things. Maybe that would be great. But they may decide that we need to turn hard line. I don't know. This is very complicated. But there's no question to my mind that they are thinking we need to evaluate how it is that we have been keeping the peace because we have lost it and we need to bring it back. This is the one legacy of the revolution. And I worry a little bit about this. I do, because I feel that as repressive as the system is, there's no bottom. You can keep making it even more repressive because these protests have really unsettled what for the armed forces was the most important victory of the Cuban revolution, which is what they thought was consolidate a stable nation state, which happened, like I said, with 250,000 troops that were sent to the Las Montañas del Escambray. And so um, the question is not so much whether it is, whether they're going to side with protesters or not, but how are they going to rethink the system in place to maintain security in Cuba? And it could go either way. Thank you, Javier. Lili and then Michael want to, to say something about this? I'm, I'm going to be real brief. I just wanted to insert the fact that according to the Communist Party rules, um, once you're a member of the party, you're eternally a member of the party. You are not allowed the right to, to drop your membership. The only way that you can drop your membership in the Communist Party is, in fact, if the party votes and allows you to leave. So, you know, in order to kind of keep people in line um, and allow for there to be a, a structural inclusion of of increasing numbers of young people in at least the feeder group of the party. You know, the, the Cuban government has extended um, the age limit to be a member of, of the communist youth now, you know, multiple times over the course of the last 60 something years. But um, the latest is now you, you could be a member of the communist youth until, youth until you're 37. 
Um, because that's an organization where you can decide, okay, I won't go on. And people, people often come up with reasons. Well, you know, I have all these problems in my house. My roof is leaking. I have my grandchildren, my grandmother, my, you know, all of that to avoid having to be a member. Because in fact, being a member is sort of like being a, a part of the mafia. You, you're not allowed to leave. And, and there are tremendous repercussions to that. I mean, the communists themselves as an organization are often subject to tremendous intimidation from within. And we don't know because of course, any of their discussions are completely um, untransparent and secret. Um, and all votes that we get are unanimous. You know, We never get like dissenting votes from the communist party because they don't exist. So I do think that there, there are some tensions within that, that system, that organization that really does mean that there are very top brass people. There's an elite to the Communist Party, there's an elite to the Ministry of the Armed Forces, and there is this network of people who are the secret police for the Ministry of the Interior. And so there, but the rest that are parts of those groups, with the exception of the Ministry of the Interior, I think, um, their, their, their reactions to things will be, are, are unpredictable. And when you ask people to go out and shoot their neighbor, you know, um, and blood runs on the streets, I don't know if this is a controllable scenario. And I do think that, that the top folks are concerned about that. I'm sorry, so that was my comment. <laughs> I just wanted to add one quick complimentary observation to what Javier was saying. I, I think his observations are, are dead on. And as, as proof of that, I would just point to what has been um, kind of a, a frequent refrain in, in, in state media uh, discourses over the, over the past few days. Um, you know, it's interesting after Diaz Canel sort of invoked the idea of combate or on the street, right? That then it, uh, the discourse became sort of very like kumbaya. But but one of the things that they've been saying over and over again is that that the you know nothing is going to take away our tranquility, right? This idea of Cuba as un país tranquilo, right? Um, and I think I think the protests, um, you know, whatever comes of them, even if nothing comes of them further, um, have have you know, poked some real holes in that, right? Um, and I think that is possibly inspiring for some Cubans, energizing. I think for others, it might be terrifying um, because I think there's, a, you know, I hear this too from people who, you know, because, you know, their perception, accurate or inaccurate, that Cuba is at least a peaceful place in comparación with, you know, America Central, donde hay gangs. And, and so, so it's like this idea of threatening the tranquility. And it goes back to Sylvia's point about the importance of whatever kind of change happens, that it be, that it be peaceful and that people feel reassured in that. Because I, I worry that any, um, uh, the idea of unrest may be anathema too, to, you know, members of the Cuban population who need to be agents of change and, and, and believers of it too. So I don't know, just another interesting um, tension, I guess, I guess at play. It's a question for Sylvia to begin with. I mean, until recently, there was a lot of legitimacy, or not a lot of legitimacy. The Cuban Revolution, the Communist Party had its legitimacy. Now, from hearing to you, the, the reasons why the Communist Party continues to be in power is fear, the way in which they are dealing with people's hunger, or fear, I mean, fear, I mean, repression and fear. And, playing with the scarcity. But to many people, Cuba is an example or was an example until very recently where there was a lot of legitimacy. And you can see that in Lily's work. I mean, of the first few years, I mean, that's the only book of yours that I have read, the first few <laughs> years of the Cuban revolution. I mean, where you see all of that enthusiasm, all of that legitimacy, all of that sacrifice, including sacrificing basic freedom. So what happened? So let's start with Sylvia. Well, I, I think the Cuban people have been learning a lot. And I, by that, I mean the Cuban people in the island. Um, I think that the, you know, things like Patria y Vida, uh, which takes off, it, you know, it's a reggaeton song, but it takes off from Fidel Castro's Patria o Muerte. And I think what the young artists are, are saying very clearly is that what they want is not Patria o Muerte, but Patria y Vida, that they want a decent life and that this is not what the government has, has been able to offer them, you know, and for, for many, many years. Uh, so I think that there are things that are being articulated now for the first time that when I went to Cuba, I always heard people express them, but no one ever expressed them publicly. 
you know, they expressed them to you when there was nobody else around, when it was clear that nobody was going to come from behind and listen to what you were talking about. You know, there, there was a, a, a different sort of conversation that took place when people trusted you and they really wanted you to know what they really felt. But the fact that people have come out publicly at this point, point in time and said, you know, we are suffering from this system and we want to change it. Is, is a remarkable sort of statement. Um, what I am hoping is that, you know, I think a lot of, like Carlos just mentioned about the early years of the Cuban revolution and the enormous legitimacy that the Cuban government managed to have at that time. Um, and at the same time, I think that, for example, the speech by Fidel Castro, when he is in the Plaza de la Revolución, as always, and he says to the people that, you know, the there is no need for people to have elections. Ele elecciones para qué? The people have already chosen. Okay. And what I'm hoping is that out of this process, the Cuban people will learn that you should never hand over institutions that are as important as the vote, as the electoral part of democracy, over to anybody, no matter how enthusiastic you may be about that person at that particular moment in time. I hope that we learn to defend democratic institutions out of this process that we have been a part of. Um, I want to uh, also tell you, I am from the Santa Clara, originally my family, I was born in Havana, but my family came from Santa Clara for many, many, many years. And I had a cousin who died uh, fighting against Batista, uh, Chiqui Gomez Luvian, Agustin Gomez Luvian. Uh, he was loved by everybody in the family. It, I don't believe that anyone in the family ever got over his loss, you know. Um, and I believe that we're going to see a process that will cost uh, a lot to the Cuban people in the island, including oftentimes lives. Uh, I just hope that we can learn from this process to, like my cousin Chiqui Gomez Lubian was doing many, many years ago to defend the institutions of democracy. That's what I would like to see uh, everybody learn from this process. Thank you, Silvia. Lili? Well, I wanna say that, you know, I, I, I like to divide the Cuban revolution into two periods, the 1960, uh, I don't include 59, <laughs> 1960 to 1991, 1991 to the present. And it's sort of easy, easy split because communism um, has to consolidate and it takes a very long time, in fact, for the Communist Party and for Marxist Leninism to be how people identified themselves. And that is really a product of the 1970s. It took that long. Um, I think that just to speak to that period when the state was legitimate, one asks, well, why was it legitimate? And one reason that we've already discussed is the history that brought everybody to that moment and that intense desire for a radical rupture with their history prior to 59. They want sovereignty, they want a national nationalist economy. And when that was not possible, it became a communist economy and people surrendered willingly, as CB has just alluded, their rights to organize the freedom of the press was celebrated when it ended um, in May of 1906, between May of 1960 and, and August, it was all gone. Um, and this kind of belief that somehow the the surrendering of one's rights would 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 promote a common good was in some ways played out in the ability of the state despite its disastrous economic policies of the 60s and the the, the embargo which was very intense a part of Cubans lives despite that it was played out in redistribution you know there was a lot of wealth in the country that the state government took and they and symbolically people also you know literally in many respects, people who had never had anything, you know, had never been able to go to, to a school in the countryside, not only went to school in the countryside, but then they got to live perhaps, you know, there were tens of thousands of women who were peasant girls who, who lived in the mansions of the high elite. They were there in the 1960s. Those schools end up closing by the early 70s. But the, during that period when there is so much, there was so much ability to redistribute wealth because there is so much wealth, that tempered you know, the, the, the absurd um, economic policies that promoted political loyalty before efficiency, before productivity, before logic, and then set the, the, the place up for the, for the Cuban government to need the Soviets 
to come in and run the economy for them and needed the Soviets to give them 4 billion bucks a year in aid. And so the period of the 70s and the 80s is not really so much of, of prosperity, but it is a period of stability, of security. And it's when these great promises of the fulfillment of you know, free access to education, free health care, greater public housing and some infrastructure, including new highways, you know, all that stuff happens, but it happens because of the Soviets' aid. Um, and I don't want to say, though, that that period is one in which people may they may have found that their state was legitimate, but that didn't mean necessarily that their their that their support for the state was their own. It was a product of their relationship with the state, both their economic and political dependence and the fact that you had no right for 30 years to take another side besides that of the Cuban Revolution. You were with us or against us. Um, and this was something that was policed in, in people's lives, in every part of aspect of their lives, you know, from cradle to grave, there was a political evaluation that was done on a monthly basis in school that was done at your workplace. You never got to read them. I mean, I could go on and on, but I also want to say that one of the key ways in which the state legitimated itself, which speaks to the threat of these protests now is that it did so through rallies, million person rallies. And, you know, these were orchestrated in 1959, 1960, 1961. You didn't have to get anybody on a bus to go. People walked, you know, people were happy to go and protest on behalf of the state and to defend what they saw as a revolutionary Cuba, not necessarily a communist Cuba, but one that needed defending against the United, the United States. And after that, you know, it became part of the of the machinery of the state in one's life the demonstration of loyalty so the the rallies and the fact that you know you had to have unanimous votes not just in the communist party but you know in your kindergarten you had to, <laughs> you know i mean the, the these things were intrinsic to the ability of the state to project uh, this this united cuba and and cubans i think their complicity with that you know, varied over time. It also varied over generation. Um, and that was often something that, that no one talked about and it, was, it has been hard to document, but it is documentable, you know, and it is, it's there. So this, but this binary just doesn't work after 1991, it still doesn't work. And yet we have the communist party arguing in ways, you know, almost identical to how Fidel argued, you know, el único crimen en Cuba es el crimen del bloqueo. You know, I can hear him, <laughs> yes, Canel, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that that also is important because you know, it, this is a moment where people are, are doing their own rally. You know, it's, a, it's the counter um, march, marcha. It's the counter um, rallification of, of their political identity that, that is being expressed. Javier? Um, I, I want to say that we could perhaps classify that period of so much passion on behalf of the Cuban revolution as an example of, you know, mob politics. Uh, what Lily is saying, there was, um, you know, um, one of the most famous Cuban movies of all times, uh, Memories of Underdevelopment, is a movie about a position that was untenable in Cuba. The main actor in that movie stays in Cuba, but doesn't want to be part of the revolution, doesn't want to be part of the opposition. And uh, it made it seem like this is a possible uh, possibility in Cuba. But as Lili was said, it was absolutely impossible. The mobs pulled you in that direction. How could you say no when everybody's rallying this way? And if you said no, the punishments were very, very, very severe. And um, so, it's hard for me to talk about legitimacy when the process that was producing the support was so subversive of the human spirit, was so uh, uh, predicated on the idea of asking citizens to surrender so much of their uh, free wills and let themselves be driven by uh, uh, the masses being mobilized. Um, but having said that, we still have a question to ask. Um, if in 1991, that system of getting citizens to uh, go along becomes bankrupt 
uh, how come it has taken this long for uh, uh, for uh, an 11th of July to show up? No, in many ways, this is perhaps the, uh, a remarkable mystery for Cuban scholars. We need to be able to think a little bit more about uh, the foundations of the longevity of this regime when that initial model of uh, uh, using the masses to produce passions and hatreds uh, 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 becomes less useful. Uh, but um, that's all I wanted to say on this. Thank you, Javier. Michael? Thanks. Um, I think the way I want to tackle this question about legitimacy, um, if we understand you know, very much taking uh, Javier's point to heart. But if we understand legitimacy as at least that state in which so many people don't seem to be will so willing <laughs> to to uh, protest in the way that they have been, I think there are some things that have changed recently too, um, like shorter term changes that maybe accelerated processes that were kind of turning along more slowly. Um, one, one that I would point to is I think, um, you know, Cuba is an island, but it is not uh, in isolation from the rest of the world. And over the last, um, you know, five years, if, the, the, the politics in the region have, have shifted a lot from a moment during the Obama administration or loosely overlapping with the Obama administration of the so-called pink tide and all that sort of discussion about the good left and the bad left, but nonetheless a left that in, in the region was united around a call on the United States to normalize relations with Cuba and therefore treated the Cuban government as simply put the, the only and, and le therefore legitimate interlocutor with which to deal with on the, on the global stage, you know, the regional environment has obviously changed a lot. Um, there still swings back and forth between right and left. I mean, we witnessed the recent elections in, in Peru, for example, but nonetheless, I think that has done something um, to the image of the Cuban state in, in a way. Um, I think so, you know, I just reflect this is more personal and anecdotal, but I think about the trajectories of friends of mine who are my same age and who starting circa 2010, I followed and observed and sympathized with as they sort of watched the government seem to come to terms with some need for some kind of reform, right? Slow moving, one step forward, one step back, all of that, right? But nonetheless, you start using the language of structural reform. You know, when Raul Castro says we need structural reforms, there were a lot of Cubans of goodwill that were willing to take him and the Cuban government up on that proposition and say, okay, let's start putting forth our ideas, right? We too don't want a social implosion. We want a soft landing. We want things to be gradual. We're, we, you know, we want to ward off against, um, uh, you know, processes of change that create more, 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 more losers and winners, right? So there was this incredible effervescence in, in Cuban civil society, a portion of Cuban civil society that was not at that point sort of in the opposition camp, but was willing to try to give the government the benefit of the doubt and to say, okay, let's play ball. You know, let's, 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 let's talk about a constitutional reform. Let's think about, you know, moving things in a gradual direction. And I think in so many ways, those, those hopes have been, um, you know, they, they, were, they were shot down. Uh, at different moments, from the, the the ups and downs of the economic reform process to the many the, the disillusionment that a lot of people felt with the shape of the 2019 constitutional reform as it um, as it occurred, um, and the things that were left out of it, right? This has galvanized, and I have seen it among friends and colleagues. Uh, you know, less of a willingness to treat the Cuban government as the, the, the legitimate interlocutor with which you, you have to deal. They may still think that this is the interlocutor with which you have to deal because that's the, the correlación de fuerzas. But, but so there's that kind of um, uh, disenchantment, if you will. And perhaps that's cyclical, perhaps that's something that's happened at a number of other times, but at least in the last you know, 10 years, I've had the opportunity to sort of witness it up close. And I, and I see that among a generation, a certain generation uh, as being particularly, particularly potent. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that I think is a major change, and it's really recent. I mean, it's only since 2016, late 2016, or actually early 2017, in the final days of the Obama administration, they get rid of wet foot, dry foot, right? They get rid of wet foot, dry foot. Cuban immigration uh, exceptionalism is by and large over. The Cuban Adjustment Act is still on the books, but the way you can still get access to that are, are very narrow at, the, at this point. 
you have to come in with a, a real visa and overstay. And that's the, if you just cross the border, you know, you can't do that anymore. And so I think, I, I guess I wonder, um, you know, not having migration as such a, an obvious worst case scenario plan for oneself. I wonder what that does to the, the, the political psyche of the people and particularly young people. Um, and I say that with a little bit of wariness because I know there have also been folks that have wanted to instrumentalize that change in US immigration policy to make an argument that this is another piece of the pressure cooker. We need to close the door so that they fix the problem and they don't have the escape valve. And ethically, morally, as a Cuban American who's a descendant of migrants who had that escape valve, I find it very um, difficult to, to assume a position where you would want to close the door on someone else, the very door that you walk, walked in through, right? But leaving that aside, I, I wonder if there is something to this, this notion of people's horizons, um, you know, closing in a sense, which doesn't mean that Cubans still aren't trying to get out and immigrate to other places. They are. They're more ready to, there's a growing community in Moscow of all places because you can get there without a visa. Um, but, but, but nonetheless, I, I wonder about that. And then, um, you know, just, just the passing of time. I mean, I mean, think about it. Someone who's 25 years old in Cuba today or 20 was born in, you know, 1995 to, to after 2000. There's so many young Cubans today who were born who never even knew the special period, let alone what came before it, which is at a time, I think for so long, so many people have kind of had an, an affinity, an attachment to that Cuba that they knew that was a product of that moment that Lily was describing the seventies and eighties when socialism seemed to work in comillas, right. In, in, in different ways. So we, we have a generation, maybe two who don't even know that. So what does that do? Well, what are their, their reference points are different. And so that, you know, I como un desgaste, sorry for slipping into Spanglish, but you know, I, I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not being very, um, I, I can't put it precisely into words, but but I think in generation is obviously a very tricky concept and <laughs> has amorphous boundaries, but I think there's something there that, that's worth thinking about. Thank you. Now let's move to the last topic. And before we open for questions from the audiences, uh, it's the reaction of the different academic communities. Uh, the Council of Latin American Social Sciences, which is an association that agglutinates most universities and research institutions and, NG and several NGOs in Latin America, of course, had a manifesto saying that the fault is the embargo and they were following the line of the Communist Party of Cuba. You also have certain voices similar to that in the United States in certain sectors of the left. On the other hand, you have sectors of uh, Cuban American politicians saying that the only road is to go there and to invade Cuba. Um, there are others that, like you guys, who in your recent op-eds and interviews with the media, what you have said is that the embargo has to end and you, we also need to promote democracy. And as Silvia was saying, a peaceful transition to, the, to, to, yeah, to, to democracy in Cuba. Yeah, okay, so apart from that, what I wanted to explore very briefly is what are the different meanings and imaginations or imaginaries about Cuba that many people continue to have? I mean, for me, sometimes it's amazing how a generation of people who struggle against the embargo, who have always defended human rights in other parts of the world have difficulty thematizing human rights in Cuba in the same way. And, 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 and of course, that's because of the dialogue with people who still live in the Cold War, trying to, to attack communism as this evil thing that is happening there. So I would like to, to get your voices and your opinions on that. So let's start with Silvia, please. Um, yeah, it's a very, um, always a sad thing for me when I see so many of my friends, academic friends who stick up for human rights everywhere in the world, but never with respect to Cuba. Okay. And I've tried to understand where that comes from because I, you know, I am a firm member of the Democratic Party in the United States. I think of myself as being center left, um, I, but I don't understand really where this comes from. I think where it comes from is the fact that part of what the Cuban revolution meant worldwide, particularly in this hemisphere, was the sort of the David versus Goliath story, you know, that that was a major image 
that Fidel Castro was able to play, Goliath being, of course, the United States, and they, David threw the young rebel that was so attractive to so many people through his sling at Goliath and was able to make a different future um, and to really contest the domination uh, of the Cuban society by the United States. And so, you know, people are unwilling to criticize David because he, you know, sent the sling to uh, undermine Goliath. Um, I think the fact is, is that that does hurt many people who are Cuban Americans, who don't believe in the embargo, who hold very liberal sorts of positions, but who do want to stand up for human rights everywhere in the world, including Cuba. And it's, and it's very hurtful to be treated in, in that sort of dismissive manner. But then again, I think that what happens is that there is no other way to criticize the United States, you know, that that is unfortunately the role that the Cuban revolution has played within the left in the United States, uh, you know, it, a channel for criticizing the United States. Michael? I think what I wanna simply say is we have to get beyond false choices and false dichotomies. Um, one can be deeply critical of the embargo, I am. Um, I'm deeply critical of a US sanctions policy, as I already said, that has had as a theory of the case for so long, a pressure cooker strategy that I consider immoral. Um, I find it particularly immoral that those sanctions were tightened during the middle of a global pandemic, right? There is no way you can justify it for me that in order for me to buy, uh, to ship, uh, to donate syringes to Cuba, if I wanted to do that now, to help with a vaccine campaign that I really hope is successful given all that, that the country's facing in terms of COVID, why should I have to ask for a, a license from the Department of Commerce for that, right? So, so we can be deeply critical of things. We can connect the legacies of those policies, the legacies of US imperialism in the region that are real. And yet we can also listen to the voices of Cuban civil society members who don't accept the false choice, um, who say, I want the embargo to end. I also want political and economic change, full stop, without one being conditional on another. Now that may be living in, uh, fantasy land, right, in terms of uh, real politique and how these things work. But I, pr I prefer to, to center those voices. Um, those are the voices whose, whose example, you know, I, I look to. I think, if, I think we also have to reckon with sort of just the long specter of the Cold War. I mean, Sylvia referenced it. Certainly there are contradictions on the left vis-a-vis -vis Cuba. There are also contradictions on the right vis-a-vis -vis Cuba that were still part of kind of how, uh, the, you know, the, the regional conversation. The idea that one could be for democracy uh, in Cuba, but um, deeply supportive of a figure like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, who has as, as many anti-democratic impulses as I think you know one could could point to with any any leader in the region. Um, there's a deeper history too. If 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 there is uh, uh, you know this frankly fascinating history of. Cuba giving asylum to people who were fleeing human rights violations in places like Chile the Southern Cone, Central America, right? Uh, and yet then not necessarily holding Cuba to the same standard when it comes to, to human rights. There's also, of course, a deep history in the region and even in parts of the Cuban diaspora of promoting democracy for Cuba, but thinking of you know, Pinochet as somebody who saved the nation from communism, of supporting or at least um, not vocally opposing genocide in Central America in the 1980s. So those legacies and contradictions, I think are really important to bring into this conversation as well, to try to get out of, um, uh, again, those false choices and that, and that, that false, those false binaries. And the last thing that I would say is, I think it's precisely for these reasons to try to uh, free us to get out of the false binary. That is why US policy has to change, right? US policy, is not responsible for everything that happens in Cuba, but it feeds this kind of false binary. It, 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 you know, we need to get rid of the United States as the boogeyman in Cuba's internal politics. And when we do so, I, I would hope that as, as academic communities um, and you know, across the region will be freer to have um, you know, a truly and more honest conversation about, about what's happening inside Cuba internally. Thank you. Lily? You are mute. Okay. 
I would say that, you know, the Cuban government, um, thinking historically here to explain some of the very, very long lives, half lives and, and, and lives and legacies that um, um, certain groups solidarity with the Cuban government has have had, despite everything they might have done, despite the hypocrisy, despite the ideological reversals of the early 1990s, despite the collapse of the educational and healthcare system in the 90s through the present that many, many foreigners have um, just forgotten to take a look at. Um, despite all that, I mean, I think that the origins um, have to do with the fact that in the 1970s and the 1980s, the Cuban government cultivated lines of solidarity by taking positions of total opposition to the Vietnam War, um, offering sanctuary to victims and activists, as Michael said, who fought right-wing US-backed military dictatorships and terrorist states in Latin America. They, they supported African-American freedom struggles, sometimes to the extent of, of arguing for the most more radical groups um, or the most radical positions um, there. Um, they supported Puerto Rican independence, but the reality is while well, that was happening, yes. Inside Cuba, Black Panthers that were arriving in the droves were being jailed as political refugees. Many of us haven't even bothered to read the memoirs that they've published, you know, because many of them lived there their whole lives. I mean, let's read William Brent's book, um, Long Time Gone. Let's, let's look at the history of how Afro-Cubans, Black Cubans, efforts to demolish racism in Cuba not only didn't work, but were denied. You know, the Cuban state has always said that one of its greatest triumphs is the end of racism in Cuba. And yet the Cuban state repeatedly and continually has created new bases, new structures, new places for racism to flourish. And those of us who are too lazy to go and look at the, the research on this are about 20 years behind. And, and it's not as if there is not there is no evidence of it. It's not as if the rappers are making it up because they didn't just make one song. They've been writing and singing about this since the 90s when they started to be able to. Um, I also think that it is really important that people in the 70s and the 80s got a badge of anti-imperialism automatically by arriving in Cuba. And the greatest, you know, sort of, um, the, the greatest power could be reaped from that. You know, anywhere you went, you said you went to Cuba. I mean, this was true for me when I came back after living in Cuba for a year in the mid 90s until people found out that I was of Cuban ancestry. And then all of these white liberals, because they generally be white liberals, would freak out. Like, oh my God, wait, no, you're an exile. Were you working for the CIA? <laughs> and then on the opposite side, right, there was this automatic, well, she can't, po uh, the, the nicer ones were the ones who said, well, she can't possibly have any critiques of the Cuban state because she's seen it for herself. I went to Cuba for a week in the 1970s and I thought it was spectacular. And you know, I mean, so to end the point, there, there is a lot of laziness out there. There is a lot of documentation by very serious scholars, by people who have lived the history, by Cubans on the island themselves. And we need to wake up and smell the coffee. We also need to stop thinking like, well, what is it? What does Cuba and solidarity with the Cuban government do for me? You know, what does it do for me? my career, my, the coherence of my position as a leftist. You know, I mean, I really find these things offensive and our research visas matter very little compared to the rights of Cubans on the island who are seeking them now. You know, who cares if it took them 30 years to finally take this form? But I've seen as a witness, you know, people struggling to find the little spaces for them to assert their beliefs in contradiction to the state, independent of the state, creativity, you know, independent of the state. And, and it, it, to me, it is not, it was not a shock that this happened. You know, I have been saying and been called a Cassandra every time I've done it. At the end of every one of the books I've written on Cuba, I have ended by saying, Cubans have found a way to democratize even in the worst of circumstances. And one day they'll do it again. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I feel like they are doing it. And we need to respect that and stop making Cuba live for our political purposes, whether that's through the embargo or it's in this moral righteousness of echoing, you know, the Cuban government that, yes, the embargo is to blame for everything. You know, I mean, let's let's stop. Let's stop. And let's not be lazy and let's not be selfish. Javier? Um, these are great words, everyone. Um, I, I want to say that it has been incredibly traumatic for Cuba to be 
abandoned to the Cuban people to be abandoned by the Latin American intellectuals who believe in human rights for as long as they have. This has been a very difficult thing, a level of isolation. I mean, Cubans are used to this. Uh, after the wars of independence of uh, South America, uh, Cuba was left alone. So uh, we're a little used to it, but it's still very, very traumatizing. It's also very traumatizing when uh, a lot of people not only criticize with their anti-imperialism, not only criticize the United States, but also criticize Cuban Americans and use language to describe uh, um, uh, those of us who have escaped that uh, uh, that system as um, 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 former slave owners who want to go back and own slaves. I mean, these are things that people say, uh, absolutely hurtful. But let's do a little bit of analysis of, of what has happened here. When the Cuban Revolution happened. I think Latin American anti-imperialists wanted a massive defeat of the United States, not a negotiation. And this is what Fidel Castro, this is how Fidel Castro sold the Bay of Pigs in Las Narices de los Norteamericanos. Hemos derrotado el imperialismo. And there was something about Latin America wanting to see this the way that you may want to see in a, in a sports match, your team, not just lose, but be absolutely uh, decimated. It also happened at a time where people didn't respect liberal democracy as much. I think now the left in Latin America has a greater appreciation for liberal democracy than perhaps in the 1960s. Because, you know, in 1915, between in, in the early 1960s, there were there was one anti-imperialist cause that became illiberal, Cuba, but there were three other anti-imperialist governments that became liberal democracies, Venezuela, Colombia, and Costa Rica. And the left could care less about those. And you know, if you're consistently anti-imperialist, you should have celebrated those three countries and you didn't because you wanted this humiliating defeat at the Bay of Pigs that Fidel Castro delivered. What is so remarkable about this position surviving to this day is that folks in this camp, and I think it's shrinking, I have to say that, that I see more and more examples of people from the left, anti-imperialists, recognizing that uh, um, uh, Fidel and the system uh, established in Cuba was uh, uh, incredibly um, colonializing is that notice what these people have done. Um, when they were confronted with the good things that the Cuban regime did for its people, they granted the state significant agency. Oh, because the, it is a government that loves the people and delivers and responds, and, and responds to uh, the people's need. But whenever you were asking them, what about their human rights abuses? There was no agency. It's produced by the Americans. And this is the, the inherent contradiction of the position of, on the one hand, exaggerating the agency on behalf of a benign, the benign aspects of the regime, and completely being blind to it, to the brutal uh, human rights abuses. I, but I want to say on a, on, a, on a good note that I am comforted to know that this is changing significantly among academics. Maybe it's generational. Uh, but it has been very traumatic, very traumatic for the cause of human rights in Cuba. Thank you, Javier. Uh, let me read some of the questions that we have from the audience. Uh, there is a question from Jessica, and perhaps it's for everybody, but perhaps Michael can start answering that. What can the U.S. government do to support the people of Cuba? The big, a big question. Um, you know, I, I would say the Biden administration, speaking concretely of now, is under a lot of pressure to do nothing, in essence, to uh, leave in place the restrictions on travel, remittances, et cetera, that were put in place by the prior administration with the idea that, you know, now is not the time. We've got them on the ropes, right? Don't don't let up. Um, that kind of thinking, I think, uh, going back to the point of agency that Javier was just mentioning, denies where the agency really lies. The agency does not lie with a U.S. policy that forces Cubans to do one thing or another. The agency lies with 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 Cuba's people. But to me, it's not it's not a contradiction in terms to make a positive argument for U.S. policy change 
that is in furtherance, in fact, whether short-term, mid-term, long-term of Cuba's and Cubans' ability to exercise real self-determination. Um, you know, I, I'm for a radical approach in that regard. You know, if, 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 if the embargo was still something that was exclusively under the purview of the White House, which it's not, I'd be, a, I'd be in favor of a Band-Aid approach, <laughs> right? Um, but, but it's more complicated than that. But the White House can poke significant holes into the sanctions regime uh, in a way that I don't think is inconsistent with, um, you know, what, what protesters are asking for. Um, I would also say that in the context of the present crisis, right, there is a real um, shortage of, of food, the shortage of over-the-counter medicines. Um, one of the things that I think the U.S. side can do immediately to try to alleviate some of that is to authorize, once again, flights to provincial cities, whether they're charter flights or commercial flights. Now, the Cuban government also has to do its part there and open up more flights from the United States. They also have flights restricted because of covid um, while they're also letting flights in from Russia and tourist destinations. So, you know, given where we are vaccine wise uh, in the U.S. and, you know, Delta variant notwithstanding, and, and you know, I am not uh, Anthony Fauci here by any means, but uh, to me, it seems like there's a pretty good argument for allowing those, those flights to provincial cities, allow Cuban Americans to do what they have always done which is even if the Cuban Americans are supporters of the embargo, and I would disagree with them to the end of my days on that, you know, under the table, everybody was still sending their family medicines, right? So let's let some of those networks of human solidarity do their thing. Um, they, they're, they're not perfect. They oftentimes have the effect of exacerbating inequalities because not everybody's got a relative on the outside that can bring them stuff. That's a real problem. We also need to empower um, organizations, NGOs to, to be able to do that work, to try to fill in some of those gaps. Um, but there's a lot that we can do that, that you know, focuses on a, a you know, fo focusing a, a, a U.S. policy approach on, on not doing harm, first and foremost, um, to, to innocent Cuban civilians, I think would, would go a long way. And I think there's a number of things we can do in that regard. Yeah. Do you want to comment something, Silvia, on this? Uh, I think Michael has expressed it very well. I think that to allow the reunification of the uh, Cuban family on both sides of the straits, so to speak, is, is a very important thing. And I think that Biden does need to do, uh, you know, uh, not only in terms of being able to send food and travel, but for example, the mail. You know, I found that there is absolutely no mail right now between Cuba and the United States. And I tried sending one of my cousins a little estampita, a little holy card of La Virgen de la Caridad, and it was returned to me because, they, you know, we have no mail uh, service to Cuba right now. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, so we, we need to reestablish some of those broken links that ultimately, uh, you know, are a form of reconciliation for people on both sides of the strait. Javier? I, let me just be a little bit candid here. Not a little bit, very candid. <laughs> I used to believe in the embargo. I have completely changed my mind. Um, I think the evidence that I have seen, not just in Cuba, but in US foreign policy is that uh, embargoes, even when they are incredibly deserved, um, do not produce regime change. They entrenched the very same uh, catastrophe that we're trying to uh, uh, eliminate. The evidence, there are exceptions, one or two, but the truth of the matter is that states that do not want to have relations with the United States love the embargo. And to me, this makes, it explains so much of why uh, the embargo hasn't worked uh, uh, in Cuba and it doesn't work in so many other places. Um, Cuban Americans who support the embargo, we need to think that this has been a public relations disaster for our cause without producing any gains. And on top of that, we're the ones who produce the biggest pores. Uh, so we're the ones who also uh, create the biggest holes in the embargo. But even if we could keep a very strictly sealed embargo, it just doesn't produce regime change. What works is bargaining leverage. And you can get states to change certain policies. That can work. 
but to try to imagine that uh, uh, through economic aggression on an evil state is going to uh, make it surrender, you know, it just doesn't do that. It might turn it even, even harsher. And yes, the truth of the matter is that it produces externalities, negative externalities. And those externalities, those negative costs are typically not paid by, como decía Lili, the members of the Ministry of the Interior. They're paid by ordinary folks. They're paid by uh, Silvia's relatives. Uh, this is a reality that we have to accept. And so I hope um, uh, the pro-embargo community has a new conversation about this and we think uh, the evidence that is out there, not just in Cuba, of how, how scant is the evidence of behalf, on behalf of embargoes truly producing regime change? Lily? The only thing I would add is that we need to restaff the embassy. I mean, we have a situation Please. here that looks like Cuba prior to 1978 um, skeletal staff, all consular services are abroad in a third country. I mean, I, you know, I don't know, but Fidel always said it was us who didn't want to have relations, you know, um, with them. And, and so I think restaffing the embassy will be a very, very, very important step um, in some direction or another, but I think in a positive direction for doing what Javier just described and also what Silvia and Michael said. Um, I also think that the, um, well, let me just leave it, let me just leave it at that. I mean, but the Havana syndrome that drove supposedly Trump to get rid of everybody in the embassy, you know, they, we, this just happened in Vienna. I mean, they're, they have figured out how to deal with this, um, you know, and I don't know that it would happen again. I, it seems to me to now have been, um, you know, decrypted as, a, as a, an act of war, an effort, an effort on the part of probably the Soviets and a certain wing of the um, Cuban administration, if we want to call it that, um, to affect exactly what they wanted, which is to get rid of people. Um, to get rid of our, our, our embassy so that we wouldn't have a presence there. And I, I think that, you know, like I've been saying repeatedly, and it's boring now in many different media opportunities, um, call the Cuban government's bluff, you know, be a, a radical friend and send down our um, diplomats, you know, um, and not so we can all just turn the other cheek, but in fact, so we can hold our ground as representatives of a different future for Cuba and a different future for the United States. Thank you. I have another question from the audience. It's a different topic, and it's from Eloisa. She asks, do you see the lack of, of an opposition leadership inside Cuba as a problem if the communist leadership leaves? Should I repeat it? No, I understood it. Oh. Repeat it or not? <laughs> no, I think we heard it. <laughs> OK. So who wants to go first? Javier, why don't you go? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, um, there are two parts of this question. Number one, uh, if there's a vacuum, it's going to get failed. There is no political vacuum that endures. Uh, a leader will emerge. But the other part of the question, which I think is the complicated one, is what happens next to the movement in Cuba without stewardship? We tend to think that these type of movements need their leaders uh, and I think that's true, but at the same time, in this world of YouTubes, in this world of, uh, uh, you know, influencers more so than political leaders, uh, we might be witnessing an interesting experiment of a movement that can acquire significant bargaining leverage uh, somewhat without a capitan. We'll see. But yes, for political scientists, there's no question that this is a, a, a strange phenomenon here. Michael? I think the only thing I, I would add is, um, <laughs> I, first, you know, as, as for um, YouTubers and influencers as our, as our new civil society leaders, I, I, I do have some, I, I have some wariness about that. That's perhaps, you know, from the, the, the comfort of my academic perch, I want to acknowledge, but I've seen on the, on the other side of the Florida Straits, how frankly in, 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 in Cuban American politics over the last few years, um, really the, the, the predominant actors seem to be moving more in that direction. And I think it's had at least, at least here, some very, some very dangerous um, effects. Yeah. 
um, the, the, the spread of misinformation, uh, in particular in the context of this recent 2020 election here locally. That's not to say the same pattern would be repeated in a, in a different context, 90 or 100 miles away. But, but you know, I, I, have some, I have some reticence, I suppose, about, about that um, uh, in, in a way. And then the other thing I just wanted to say in terms of leadership, um, you know, I, I see happening in Cuban civil society a certain kind of coalescence which doesn't mean that there aren't differences and tensions and, and arguments as there have often been, right? Um, in the history of the island's politics and the history of Elisilius politics. But, um, you know, there, there used to be this kind of real fissure between, you know, those who self-identified as opposition and those who self-identified as some of those kind of more reformist or, you know, the, the voices that I, that I mentioned, they, they, they kind of kept distance from one another. Um, and frankly, the the hostile reception that that middle sector got at a certain point, I think, has pushed many in the other direction. And so, um, you know, there is a, a closing of the ranks in, in that regard in Cuban civil society, in Cuban independent media, uh, state media or non-state media, I should say, um, that I think has been has been noteworthy um, over the last, you know, just just two, three years. Um, so, you know, where that goes, I'm not sure, because the other thing that's happened is that a lot of these folks are no longer on the island. They're they're outside. Um, and, and that I think limits, uh, in a certain way, doesn't limit their ability to do good journalism, but, but limits their, their, perhaps, um, their, their, the, 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 their ability to serve as, as political leaders. And I'm not even sure if, if they want to, I mean, some of the brightest voices I think that I know are doing just wonderful work as writers and observers, maybe they don't want the mantle of political leadership. Um, so that's an open question as to who, who fills that vacuum. I guess I would like to, to say that I don't see such a lack of leadership within Cuba. I think that there have been many dissident groups for a number of years that have expressed themselves very well uh, in writing, you know, and that have a following. Uh, they have remained small because the Cuban people knew what the costs of joining any dissident groups were. But I think, of, for example, UMPACO, uh, a National a Patriotic Union of Cuba, uh, the leadership of people like Guillermo Fariñas, for example, um, who has been in multiple hunger protests and uh, asking for Cubans to have access to the internet as they finally got. Uh, Dagoberto Valdez and his group uh, centered on the magazine called Convivencia, which used to be Vitral, uh, has been speaking for many, many years. And all of these people are very how shall I say, committed to remaining inside of the island. They don't have the slightest intention of leaving. Um, I don't know all of them. I, mean, <laughs> I, I live far away from them, but I think that they have been there and they have been there for a long time. I think what we will see is with this protest and future protests, new faces, new voices come up that haven't been there in the past. But you know, there's plenty of people who have been there for a long time, essentially talking about the Cuban spring, you know, modeled after the old Czechoslovakian spring. Uh, there, there are people who have articulated the alternative uh, very well for a very long time, I think. Lily? First, I wanna <clears throat> say that I think that history is going to serve, should serve as, um, you know, as our guide. And in the two moments when the when you know the U.S. media was declaring that there were no leaders in Cuba and that there was chaos, um, that was an enabler for the United States to step in and co-opt its group of leaders. And we always tend to back up the most conservative side. So we did that in 1898, and we did it in 1933. Um, and in both of those moments, you didn't just have lots of folks who were there and were you know provincial leaders who step forward or university leaders who step forward, artists and intellectuals. You also had the return of um, recently exiled people who had left and lived maybe three years, maybe 10 years abroad. And they came back by the tens of thousands. That was true between 1898 and 1902 when Tampa and New York were practically depopulated of their Cuban populations. That was true in 1933 when, you know, some of the best activists, the unarmed, the intellectuals came back from Mexico where they had been driven after they had been jailed by the Machado dictatorship. What made the difference was in terms of their ability to democratize, to organize, to create the foundations of a constitutional republic was the United States. And we need to not do that again. 
or we are going to destroy the future of Cuba as we have destroyed it in the past. And that to me is very concerning because I keep hearing whether this is leaderless. No, it's not. You know, there are thousands of Cubans, both on the island and abroad, who are extremely well-educated, who have been analyzing this to death, who have great degrees of credibility among the populations, even if there are small ones with which they interact. And I also think that the Cuban government has done a very good job of discrediting the very people that Silvia Pedraza just mentioned. Um, and you know, I, I don't think, frankly, that a lot of them are gonna have a lot of traction um, with the majority of the population. The fact that these desinteresados, because that's always been a key moniker for those revolutionaries who have, that have weight, you know, the desinteresados have tended to be the, the intellectuals, the writers, the artists, the people, you know, who were members of the upper middle class, and Cuba doesn't have an upper middle class, but they have a professional class, you know, and, and like those journalists that Michael just mentioned. Um, so I just personally don't have any qualms. I feel like, or fears that there isn't a leadership, you know, thank God there's not one, because when there was one, that was a strategy on the part of the 26th July movement, which had thousands of, of activists in the cities and just a few hundred guerrillas in the, in, the, in the mountains. And they decided that they would just put the face of Fidel onto the movement. And then they lost everything because the people who had sacrificed the most were not Fidel Castro in the mountains. It was the people who, were, who lost their family members who lived for three years, moving from one underground apartment to the next so that they could resist the Batista dictatorship. And they were anonymous. You know, so luckily there isn't one face and there isn't this kind of one single organized movement. I think we have, we don't have chaos. We have people who are ready, you know, and this is their moment. And it, God willing that it comes to fruition and the United States does not try to co-opt a group or, you know, these are our people, this is the guy. I mean, we're doing that currently in Haiti. We have lots of, lots of experience doing that. We need to not do that. And we intellectuals and those people in the US community who care about sovereignty of nations and care about political process and democracy and agency, we need to be on the front lines to prevent that. But in solidarity and behind the islanders and those who have a legitimate right to be there and will return with that goal. And, and it's going to be, it's, I really don't think it's going to be the guys who left in 1961, you know, or it's going to be the people who left a few years ago, you know, or those who have recently left because of the rollback on the, their ability to, to take advantage of the openings created in the Obama years and with the early reforms of the, of the, of the Raul administration that have been in some ways undercut or simply eliminated. Thank you. Um, well, Good things always have to come to an end. This has been a fantastic panel. I really appreciate uh, the opinions, the, uh, the reflections of our panelists. They were fascinating. So I want to thank Professor Bustamante, Professor Corrales, Professor Guerra, Professor Pedraza for helping us to understand what is happening in Cuba, what are the meanings and what we can do. And I also want to thank and to apologize to our viewers we have like, 90 something viewers, sometimes more, sometimes less. But <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't have a more democratic setting because there are people who like to bump on, on Zoom when they get bored, so I don't know. So we have to do it this way. I really appreciate this. This will be your participation, your listening to this, your viewing this. This will not be the last event on Cuba. We will continue to have conversations as much as we can. And thank you very much. And I hope that next time, and, I, and next time we'll do it on person so we can go and have a drink afterwards. Okay? That would be wonderful. <laughs> that would really yes. be nice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, many thank you so much, time. Carlos. Many thanks. For, thank you. Th thank you for putting this together, Carlos, very yeah, quickly. Um, very quickly. Uh, 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 great, great public service. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.